Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the people, the traditional custodians in whose lands we're joining from today throughout Australia. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and those emerging. I'm Ragini Singh, I'm the Director of the Grants Management Office at the Health and Medical Research Office for the MRFF. Welcome to the second ARIO webinar. Uh, these MRFF webinars will be an ongoing offering offered twice a year. The session today will cover a range of topics, beginning with the intent and purpose of these webinars, and the rest of the topics today will be presented to you by MRFF directors. So the aim of these RAO webinars is to provide practical information to the sector, in particular to the research administration officers, and to advise them about MRFF administrative requirements and arrangements. It's also to assist any grantee, potential or current, in better understanding the MRFF research requirements and in better supporting the funded research and researchers that we fund through the MRFF grants. It's also to aid the implementation of any changes to MRFF grants administration, and it's a vehicle for us to seek feedback from the research administration offices on the ground with a view to continuous improvement of our own administrative practices. So with that, I might hand over to Steph Lihoski, who's going to talk about consumers and the MRFF. Thanks, Ragini. My name's Steph Lihoski. I'm um, Acting Director of the Policy and Support Team here in the Health and Medical Research Office and we lead our work to increase consumer involvement um, in implementing the MRFF, particularly through supporting the Consumer Reference Panel. Today we'll talk through, I'll touch on that panel, um, also on principles for consumer involvement in research funded by the Medical Research Future Fund, consumer involvement in grant assessment criteria and our future work program. So the Medical Research Future Fund Consumer Reference Panel was appointed in April 2022. Its role is to provide advice to the CEO of HMRO on strategies for strengthening consumer involvement in MRFF implementation. Members were identified by key se sector groups approached by the department. Um, and given the momentum the, cur the current members have, we're looking to extend their term and the panel for at least another 12 months and to strengthen with some additional um, expertise, for instance, First Nations and culturally and linguistically diverse representation. Currently we have 10 members and they participate as individuals rather than representing specific organisations. Their nominations were based on existing or previous experience in health and medical research, but importantly, also the ability to represent the views of the broader community, just not their own lived experience, and also to ensure a balanced cross-section of the Australian community and the appropriate level of skills and expertise Generally, our members are not academics. And the department wants to hear and learn from the members, noting that consumers and their families are the ultimate funders, users and beneficiaries of health and medical research. And we really see that consumer involvement can help the Medical Research Future Fund fund the research that has the best possible opportunity for improving the health and well-being of individuals and improve consumer confidence in and engagement with that research. The panel have met five times and have progressed work outside the meeting as well. Um, the initial deliverables in our terms of reference, which is up on um, the department's website, was development of principles for consumer involvement in medical research. Um, future funded research, and I'll get to that in the next slide. They were actually uh, released last week um, and endorsed by Minister Butler. I'll go through those in a minute. Um, important to note the principles are a statement of best practice and future intent, and they don't put requirements on researchers immediately. And it will 
we as the department will work with the sector to implement them over time. As we work through MRFF processes with the consumer reference panel, we'll definitely consult the sector. Um, as Dr. Anne Raimondo will talk through in more detail shortly, the MRFF's assessment criteria descriptors were refreshed in late 2022. These changes were based on advice from ongoing sector engagement, including the consumer reference panel. Um, the panel suggested wording to make requirements for consumer involvement stronger and clearer, um, and that's now reflected in, in new grant opportunities. At a high level, the panel aimed to incorporate the following themes into the assessment criteria, lived experience, diverse consumer populations, and consumer involvement at all levels and stages of research, from prioritising research questions, co-design, conduct, dissemination, and implementation. And also support for consumers on advisory panels and committees, not just as participants. And also ensuring research teams have appropriate skills and experience to affect, effectively involve consumers and provide safe environments and support and that they have lived experience where relevant. Consumer Reference Panel also has a, has a range of broader comments of the assessment processes that we'll work through. The panel will also and review and provide advice to us on other MRFF processes, and I'll go through that in a minute also. So as I touched on, we've just released um, the Consumer Reference Panel's Principles for Consumer Involvement in Research funded by MRFF, um, up now up on the department website, and includes a, an agreed definition of consumer for MRFF use. As you can see, that at a high level, the, the principles are that research funded through MRFF will involve consumers in every type of research, at all stages of research, in partnership with researchers, effectively, sensitively and safely, and with broad diverse, diversity and equity. We, we appreciate that the current focus of the principles is external and researcher focused, but we also know that the CRP are gonna guide us through improving MRFF internal processes in future. <clears throat> <clears throat> it's important again, as I said before, to note the principles are a statement of intent. They don't put requirements on researchers immediately and we look forward to working with the sector over time to embed those through our processes. <clears throat> In the principles are implementation guidance to give researchers examples and more detail on what the principles would look like in practice. It's examples of what good consumer involvement looks like, tangible advice to help start implementing the principles and hopefully support in considering consumer involvement in all, all phases of research. The panel have also identified a number of key areas of interest for their future work program. Um, they appreciate that much of this has to happen in parallel, but priorities for them are review and potential improvements to MRFF application processes. Um, all new MRFF grant opportunities contain the refreshed assessment criteria um, that Anne will talk through shortly. And you might also have seen in the currently open 2023 consumer-led grant opportunity that applic applicants are required to provide a two-page statement summarising the consumer involvement. And this includes further strengthening consumer involvement in the assessment of MRFF applications. That will be reviewed before a broader rollout is undertaken. We're appreciative that resources are tight for researchers. We're planning to develop clear guidelines to support researchers so they can more confidently know that costs associated with consumer involvement can be included in applications and spent from MRFF grant funds. That's it for now, um, but we look forward to sharing updates from the Consumer Reference Panel by the department's website. Over to you, Ragni. Thank you, Steph. I'll now invite Dr. Anne Ramondo to talk about the grant assessment criteria refresh. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Ragni, and thanks, Steph. Um, my name's Anne. I'm the director of the program management office for the MRFF here in the Department of Health and Aged Care. 
Um, and today I just wanted to spend some time taking you through recent changes as Steph foreshadowed to the grant assessment criteria for MRFF grant opportunities. Um, why and how they've been refreshed and what this means for applicants and REOs and assessors. So I'll start with um, a very brief overview of the MRFF assessment criteria themselves. All applications for MRFF funding are assessed against the same four criteria. So there are three numerically weighted criteria. These are project impact, project methodology and capacity, capability and resources. And there's one non-weighted criterion, overall value and risk. Now in the guidelines for MRFF grant opportunities, section five provides a definition of each of these criteria and further descriptive text in dot point form that specifies the information that should be provided by an applicant in response to each of these criteria. Uh, and examples of this descriptive text are indicated uh, on the slide in italics. While the four assessment criteria are universal across MRFF grown opportunities, these descriptors for each criterion can be different. And that depends on factors such as uh, the grant type being offered. So for example, they would be different for grant opportunities offering large accelerator grants compared to small scale incubator grants or targeted calls for research. Um, or the type of research a particular grant opportunity is aiming to fund. For example, applicants to a grant opportunity that seeks to fund clinical trials will be required to provide details of the trial design under project methodology and applicants to a grant opportunity involving international partnerships um, will be required to provide details of those partnership arrangements under capacity, capability and resources. As you already know, the scoring matrices and the overall value and risk rating scale included with the guidelines are used by assessors to gauge how well an application responds to each criterion. So it's these descriptors indicated on the slide in italics which applicants use to write applications and the scoring materials which assessors use to score those applications that have recently been updated. So I wanted to spend some time uh, providing the context for these changes um, which are now standard across all MRFF grant opportunities. Um, the refresh of our assessment criteria is part of a broader program of continuous improvement across the whole of the Medical Research Future Fund that spans policy, process and operational improvements. So our intent is to continually strive to ensure that the MRFF funds priority driven research that is informed by diverse voices and experiences. We do this through several channels, uh, including feedback from across the research sector, including from applicants and assessors and REOs, um, outcomes of public consultations and roundtable discussions, advice from diverse expert advisory bodies, such as our consumer reference panel and our Indigenous Health Expert Advisory Board, and lessons learned from previous grant opportunities. And the key changes to the assessment criteria descriptors have been informed by the outcomes of these processes and can be summarised um, in the following four dot points that I've indicated here. The first is um, streamlining and simplification of language to assist applicants and assessors and clearly draw out the elements uh, to be assessed. Um, integrating specific expectations for research that focuses on priority populations, which are clearly defined in the Grant Opportunity Guidelines and include First Nations Australians, older people experiencing diseases of ageing, people with rare or currently untreatable diseases or conditions, people in remote and rural communities, people with a disability, individuals from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, LGBTIQ plus people and youth. And there's, there are also now more explicit expectations for consumer involvement across the life of the grant as Steph presented to us just a few minutes ago. So the scoring materials that are used by assessors to score applications have been updated to align with these changes. So what do these changes mean? 
Well, first of all, I want to emphasise that MRFF applications will continue to be assessed against the same four criteria. However, the information that applicants are required to provide in response to each of those criteria is unique to the grant opportunity. Now, the grant opportunity guidelines are always the source of truth for application requirements. So the key message for you today is don't assume all MRFF grant opportunities are the same. Check sections five and six of the guidelines in particular. These are your best guide to what kind of research the grant opportunity is seeking to fund what information you're required to provide in response to each criterion and in what form. The MRFF and its administering hubs provide guidance and support to MRFF grant assessment committees on how to interpret and use the assessment criteria and scoring materials based on the information specified in those sections. So they are your best source of truth and guidance. And the department will continue to be actively involved in this process as grant assessment committees incorporate more diverse voices and experiences into the assessment of applications. As Steph foreshadowed earlier, it's a key priority for the Medical Research Future Fund that we actively pursue strengthened involvement of consumer and priority populations in the overall delivery of the MRFF. So this will be reflected not only in further refinements to the assessment process, but also the design and implementation of future funding calls. So I will leave it there and hand back to Ragini. Thank you, Anne, for taking us through the criteria refresh. I would like to remind the audience that you can um, start sending in questions, but we will have a separate Q&A session at the end after all the speakers have finished presenting. I'd now like to pass to Associate Professor Cindy Cameron, who's going to talk us through the monitoring, evaluation and learning aspect. Thanks very much, Ragini. I'm lucky last, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about, um, as a slice suggests, monitoring, evaluation, and learning activities at the MRFF. Uh, and I'm speaking to you as Director of uh, Performance and Evaluation within the, um, um, the Health and Medical Research Office. Um, so I'll talk you through briefly about um, the strategy behind the monitoring and evaluation and learning activities uh, at the MRFF and some of the activities that we have um, uh, pro progressed um, uh, that have taken place and are in progress. Uh, I'll t mention a little bit about the performance indicators that we've just recently published, um, as well as um, uh, activities relating to reporting um, of um, funding, um, funding statistics and information about grants. Um, so here we go. Um, so monitoring and evaluation um, at the MRFF occurs continuously, and we actually have a, a framework for doing this. Um, and this um, the, the, for this framework is published um, in 2020-2021, uh, and you can find this on the departmental website. Uh, the, the, this document, the Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Strategy uh, for the MRFF, uh, contains um, the framework as well as the strategy as to how uh, continuous monitoring and um, uh, learning activities can uh, take place and also uh, sets out a schedule for um, our learning um, monitoring and evaluation activities. The, um, the um, document was um, put together uh, based on uh, legislative and strategic documents um, relevant to the M that help guide the MRFF and it was um, um, put together in consultation with stakeholders from the health and medical research um, community as well as an industry and other stakeholders. Um, so so um, one of the things that um, are um, contained within the framework is the underscoring of that, that um, all the MRFF evaluations need to be independent or uh, uh, need to be um, uh, conducted in an independent manner. And part of that um, involves evaluation of MRFF initiatives. The um, evaluation strategy actually establishes a schedule for a rolling series of MRFF initiatives. And the goal of these initiatives is to assess the progress of, um, of the program and guide future investments within initiatives. And to date, three MRFF evaluations have been completed and these relate to the RAT or the Rapid Applied Research Translation Initiative um, the Medical Research Commercialization um, Initiative, as well as the Million Minds Mental Health Research Mission. 
Um, and two are currently in progress, and these are the Australian Brain Cancer Mission and the Clinical Trials Activity. Um, and when evaluations are completed, you will find a publicly available report published on the department website, um, and these links will be available to you um, on the slide deck uh, after the webinar. Um, and so what the, um, what the monitoring evaluation strategy also sets out is a... Um, uh, defining uh, based on what was um, what was defined as the impact measures of the MRFF. So many of you will know that the MRFF is a priority-led fund with a key emphasis on translation. And so it follows that the um, uh, the key impact measures that, that um, by which MRFF success is measured um, are centered around those um, are centered around translation and um, uh, and the ability to to uh, improve Australian lives and um, and economic growth, so you you see this listed here in this um, in this logic um, diagram for those of you who are familiar with such things, um, and that is better health outcomes, beneficial change to health practice, increased health efficiency, um, increased job and export potential, and economic growth. Now, many of you will also be familiar already with the measures, the, the eight MR5 measures of success. Uh, which is one of the key features of the monitoring and evaluation strategy. It outlines the eight measures of success that lead towards these five impact measures. And these measures of success, um, as uh, you may know already, are increased focus on research on areas of unmet need, more Australians access clinical trials, new health technologies are embedded in health practice, and new health interventions are similarly embedded in health practice. Is a measure of success around um, the ability of co the research community to have greater capacity and capability to undertake translational research. Um, there's a measure of success around health professionals being able to adopt best practices faster, and one on the ability of for the community to engage with and adopt new technologies and treatments. And finally, the increased commercialization of health and medical research outcomes. Um, and so, these eight measures of success are something you would have had to deal with, um, or, or applicants would have, um, or applicants and grantees would have had to deal with in putting together their applications um, for MRFF grant opportunities, as well as um, for grantees to consider when they put together their progress reports. And why are they important? Well, measure the impact, measuring impact of the MRFF. Um, both in terms of the program success as well as the impact of the research being funded um, benefits the public, researchers, consumers, government and other stakeholders. Um, as you can imagine, it promotes the accountability of the MRFF. Um, it also provides policy and research benefit by supporting translation of research outcomes into practice by pro providing a framework by which um, we can consider um, translation activities and, and, um, and, um, and success. Um, measuring the impact of the MRFF also helps pro promote public engagement, supports the community in engaging in research. If they're aware of the successes and uh, what efforts um, um, the MRFF are, are, are putting in towards uh, um, health and medical research translation, then uh, they have a better opportunity to be able to be engage with the research that's being conducted. And um, related to that is that it pr promotes visibility of MRFF research, not just to um, um, Australia, but on the international stage as well, and allows for a basis for comparison. Um, measuring the impact of the MRFF also benefits individual researchers because it provides um, researchers with the evidence or um, uh, allows assistance um, in them building evidence to support future funding applications. It helps them uh, in considering their impact uh, provide evidence for their own career progression. Um, it gives them the opportunity to assess their research achievements, the opportunity to strategically prioritize research activities. And this researchers would already be familiar with this, with um, um, the, um, for instance, with uh, the NHMRC increasingly asking researchers to consider the impact in their applications, um, in 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 their research applications, um, in their grant applications. So. Having the measure of success um, framework to work with, what we've done recently is to add a layer of detail to the measure of success, which are, as you can imagine, fairly high level. We've recently developed a set of performance indicators to enable us to start assessing and tracking progress towards these MRFF measures of success and ultimately be able to measure the impact of the MRFF. Um, so here is one, um, uh, that logic diagram with more detail um, attached to it. Um, and you'll be able to find this on our website. It was um, as it was published um, just last week. 
the uh, under the monitoring and evaluation section of the um, of the um, uh, um, of the website. So, with the um, inputs and the activities that um, take place um, within the MRFF or that go to, um, towards the MRFF, you can see that uh, what we're ultimately working towards is the impact measures, um, at, um, the five impact measures at the end, and the measures of success being the outcomes that lead towards those impacts. The performance indicators that we've come up with sit um, at one level below the um, measures of success, and they are meant, as I indicated before, to enable us to track progress against those outcomes and ultimately impacts. And they're broadly divided into, categorized into nine performance indicators from projects targeting priority populations, uh, those targeting emerging issues, um, which um, um, uh, Anne has already touched upon earlier. Um, um, and we are also looking at um, uh, outputs or, or um, um, indicators that relate to a clinical trial activity, um, research workforce indicators, which attempt to capture uh, increasing cap capability and capacity of the research workforce. Um, we also have knowledge gain indicators, acknowledging that um, we, whilst the MRFS is focused on translation, we do um, consider knowledge gain as, a, um, as an indicator of success. Um, and, um, uh, and, and this also um, re reflects that we do uh, fund a certain amount of discovery research as well. Um, as you've heard from Steph before, we are increasingly um, uh, focusing on the ability to involve consumers at all stages of the research pipeline. So there will be um, in, there are indicators in relation to that as well, as well as healthcare change indicators and indicators in, in um, indicating progress towards commercialization. And we recognise, um, as is often the case with these things, that um, quantitative measures are not sufficient to be able to track progress. Of, um, towards impact, which can often be very highly complex and highly nonlinear. And in these cases, qualitative um, studies, uh, qualitative descriptions or case studies demonstrating um, impact are also a considered an important source of information and output to be able to track against outcomes and impacts. So I'll, um, I won't go into every single um, one of the nine performance indicators in detail. You can find it on a website, but I'll give you an example as, um, with one of the, um, uh, by one of the uh, performance indicator. Uh, in this case, I selected the consumer involvement indicators. And as I briefly mentioned before, um, this hopefully allows us to capture the level of involvement in relevant um, consumers throughout the research pipeline, from priority setting to co-design through to dissemination of um, all the way to translation as well. Um, so we look at measurable outputs such as the number and value and proportion of projects that include consumer organizations as project partners or advisory groups, they in projects that involve consumers in priority and co-designer study, that involve active consumer input in data gathering or analyses, active dissemination of results to consumers, uh, that deploy strategies to include traditionally underrepresented groups and to be able to access them or provide access to these groups. Um, and those that involve consumers in project governance as well. So you'll see this is, um, I hope you can see that what we've done is to try and provide more detail to these very high level measures of success um, uh, uh, in order to um, um, uh, assist you in your consideration of how you can meet, uh, how researchers can meet measures of success or, or track towards them. Now, in saying all this, we acknowledge that measuring research impact is not easy. And many of you will already be familiar in this space. Um, known challenges include that um, in um, gathering evidence and linking research from funded projects all the way to higher level impacts. Uh, we also know that impact is a longer term um, indicator. It's now uh, well published that it can take typically up to seven years um, for research um, to be um, to be published from the point of it being funded, and it can take 17 years um, to, for research to be actually translated into health policy and outcomes. Um, there is a, uh, there are challenges also um, um, related to attribution. So to what extent can you attribute an, a success or an impact to a particular funder or a project or a researcher or an organization? Um, and as I briefly mentioned before, links between the research and its impact is not always linear, and so this can be quite challenging to try and quantify and map uh, and track. However, these indicators represent a first step towards the understanding of the MRFF's impact, and our aim is to continually review these indicators as time goes by um, against uh, true 
uh, to our intent to continually uh, learn and improve uh, our processes as well as our um, uh, understanding of impact for the MRFF. Um, so how will we try and measure these indicators? So the department will aim to collect the information and data on these performance indicators from a range of sources. Um, we'll make use of as much as we can uh, information that is already available to us via the grant administration processes anyway. Um, program information from administrative grant data, um, the progress and final reports that, um, that researchers, that grantees submit, they capture a wide range of data. Um, they contain information often of clinical trials, publications, workforce capacity and capability and impact case studies. And we'll be looking to continually improve how we can capture data from those as well over uh, the next um, future, over the near future. Um, what we cannot collect, we will try and um, capture via survey to grantees. Um, and um, care will be taken to minimize burden on researchers, which we are, are highly cognizant of. Um, and we will try to do this um, uh, on a regular basis to be able to pro um, track progress uh, uh, um, over time. And we'll also pull up, uh, pull up data from other sources as well, from bibliometrics databases, from clinical trials registries, uh, submissions for regulatory approval, uh, reimbursement and patent registries. Um, our aim is to be able to produce a report on these performance indicators in the next financial year, which will help us support uh, broader policy program and program development and improvement as well. So what does this mean for researchers? So as I alluded to briefly too, the department will continue to monitor the progress and final reports that you submit to help support our assessment of impact. I mentioned the survey before, and that's planned for later this year again, taking care to minimize researcher burden. Um, but what this also can help, um, and what we also hope is that the research, that researchers can use the performance indicators as a means to consider their own impact um, in both in terms of their applications and um, um, in, in their writing of their progress reports, wherever they are asked to identify their project's contribution to the MRFF's measures of success. So these performance indicators don't form part of formal um, application assessment or, or, or aren't, uh, aren't uh, explicitly mentioned in progress reports at the moment, but they provide a guide as to how you may be able to address the measures of success. Um, and they are, they are by no means exhaustive um, uh, and they will be continually reviewed as well as we learn more about uh, what the impact of our research uh, that we fund are. Um, and we also hope that these performance indicators can help researchers consider their impact of their own research at all stages along the research pipeline, even from the point of design of their um, of the research. Um, and we also have a request um, to enable us to facilitate uh, accurate and broader data capture. We ask that um, researchers to please attribute the MRFF for the Department of Health in your publications. Um, this is something that we have found to be a challenge and it would really assist us greatly. Um, and, um, and finally, overall, from a big picture point of view, your participation in MRFF evaluation activities help us improve and help us shape the operation of the MRFF and hopefully will, uh, will result in improvements in the health and medical research sector more broadly. Now, I'll just briefly touch on this, but part of monitoring and evaluation is also reporting. Um, and I know that um, there is a, a lot of uh, desire from the sector to um, see more reporting from the MRFF. The department is working on improving its reporting of grants data to the public. You may already be aware that we already currently publish a list of grantees um, uh, 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 awarded that's uh, on, on the department website. Uh, what you may not know is that uh, we also produce other reports. Um, there is a report, for instance, on financial support for medical research and innovation priorities, um, which are updated every two years in accordance with changing of the priorities. This is available also on the departmental website. Um, and uh, we are working towards incorporating more detailed funding information, information and statistics into our reporting more generally. You may also be aware that we've published a gender data report, um, uh, first published in March last year and so to be um, updated and to be updated annually. And this is also available from the department website, department's website. Um, and if you are interested um, in any more information about uh, monitoring evaluation um, activities and the strategy and about reporting, uh, you can find that information uh, by following this web link to that particular section of the health department's website. 
Uh, and if you have any questions about um, the performance indicators or about evaluations more generally, you're very welcome to contact the evaluations team. Uh, we are available at that email address. Um, I think that covers my part of the um, of the webinar, so I will hand over back to Ragini. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Cindy, for that great presentation. We will now proceed to the question and answers section of um, this webinar. But prior to taking questions from the audience, I just want to pass uh, over to Anne to address a query that's come in previously through email with a request to address it as part of this webinar. And that query relates to partner versus participating institutions on grant applications and letters of support. So Anne, over to you to answer that. Thanks, Ragini. Um, yes, so as Ragini said, we're aware that there have been some questions from the sector about um, the role of partner organisations in MRFF applications. This is obviously something that applies specifically to applications submitted through NHMRC as the administering hub, um, particularly in relation to their contribution to the project and the requirement for letters of support um, and institutional contact. Uh, contracting requirements should an application be successful. Um, I guess the headline message is that it's not our intent to increase the administrative workload for applicants or REOs, but this can, we acknowledge that this can be an unintended consequence of the wording in our guidelines as it currently stands. So we are actively working with NHMRC to clarify this wording and it will be reflected in the guidelines for future grant opportunities. And we will also be um, preparing and circulating further information which will be made available to you in the next few months that explains those requirements. So I just wanted to provide reassurance to you all that we understand and appreciate um, the current administrative issues that you're experiencing and our overall intent is to um, reduce that unintended consequence in the changes to the guidelines in the future. Thank you, Anne, uh, for addressing that question. Um, so we're receiving questions from the audience here today, which we'll attempt to answer. And any that we're unable to get to in time or don't have the appropriate directors here present on the day to answer on the spot, uh, we will take away on notice and publish the responses on the MRFF webpage. When responses are published, they're generally also communicated through the MRFF newsletter. I'd like to highlight that uh, we did receive a lot of questions following the ARIO webinar last year and uh, in general uh, throughout the year from the sector. Those questions have been collated and responses have been now provided on the MRFF webpage uh, along with the recording of the previous ARIO webinar. So please check that out if you haven't already. Um, in relation to these questions, so um, the first one today is asking about um, can a researcher pay a consumer for their time writing a grant application? Can this be included in the application budget? So yes, consumer costs, uh, if the consumer is on the research team, uh, they are supported and there are um, specific eligible and ineligible expenditure uh, um, details which are outlined in the grant opportunity guidelines. Section four generally specifies these which are the direct costs of research. What can't be done is retrospective costs, i.e. costs incurred prior to that grant activity commencing cannot be claimed through grants. Um, so I will invite other directors if they, if they want to add to that. No, I, I think um, not. So I'll move on to the next question, which states some Grant opportunities say addressing a priority population is mandatory. Others do not. For those that do not, will applications not addressing a priority population be scored lower? I might invite Anne to answer that one. Sure, thanks Ragini. Um, so I guess what I would start off by saying is that um, applicants proposing research that focuses on a priority population according to the definition in the guidelines will always be required to address additional descriptors um, in their response to each criterion. And these are always specified in section five. So if your application focuses on a priority population, whether it's a mandatory requirement, 
for the grant opportunity or not, um, there will be those additional descriptors um, in section five that you'll be required to address. Um, if a grant opportunity is seeking to fund research that does require or prefer a focus on a priority population, this will always be specifically highlighted in section 1.3. Um, which is where you will find the objective statements for the grant opportunity, as well as section five. So if an application does not focus on a priority population under circumstances where it is required or preferred um, and stated as such in section 1.3, then they may not score well as their research doesn't align with the objectives of the grant opportunity. Um, but that's the only scenario in which that would be the case. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we're getting quite a few questions on assessments and uh, releasing uh, outcomes and scores, essentially. So I might combine those questions so that we can address them in one go. Um, the questions state, why when we have an exemplar such as the NHMRC for assessment and communication of assessment with scores, and freely available outcomes, which is transparent, does the MRFF not do this? It would not only assist applicants to improve their competitiveness, but also enable research services, the research community, and the institutes to improve applications, which can only help uh, those who can benefit from this valuable research, the national community. There's also ones that are requesting uh, publishing MRFF outcome reports, and uh, questions around publishing success rates, as mentioned, similar to what NHMRC and ALC do. So I might uh, address a part of that and then hand to Cindy to talk about it a little further. But I would like to acknowledge that, yes, that's something that the departments actively uh, engage with and, and does acknowledge. And we have made several improvements in the recent months to try to address some of these questions and concerns. One of these improvements has been that we now uh, aim to release successful and unsuccessful notifications out to the sector at the same time, on the same day. In addition, uh, what we're working with our two hubs, NHMRC and the Business Grants Hub to do is to provide some feedback to applicants in addition to scores. So scores are already provided to applicants um, who apply through, um, who apply for MRFF grants through NHMRC. Cindy, I might call upon you to um, address the um, release of outcomes and, and reports related to that part of the query. Thanks, Ragini. Yes, um, as Ragini indicated, in terms of um, um, outcomes and scores, that is something that we're already working towards. Uh, but in addition to that, um, um, funded rates, success, fun, uh, funding success rates is also something we're very mindful that um, it is important for visibility and for transparency. Um, and as you can appreciate, uh, MRFF runs across a large range of grant opportunities. Uh, and so um, it is not a, uh, it, it is a task that we are working towards together with the grant hubs, but, uh, this incorporates both NHMRC as well as Business Grants Hub to be able to provide these scores, not just as a one-stop, but just more regularly in our reporting in general. So that is something that we are working towards. Back to you, Raghini. Thank you. Um, there's also just a slightly nuanced version of that question, Cindy, about uh, a request to also please include streams when announcing applications or including information on the website. Um, again, um, echoing Cindy's words there, we'll definitely take all of this feedback on board as we're continually aiming to improve the way in which we release outcomes and provide data back into the sector, so thank you for those questions. There's a question uh, regarding will the PowerPoint slides be provided to the applicants? Yes, um, so PowerPoint slides will definitely be provided to the applicants, uh, sorry, to the participants uh, after the session. Uh, they will be uploaded to the MRFF webpage and they'll be communicated once they're uploaded through the MRFF newsletter. So please sign up to the newsletter if you'd like to keep track of when we uh, publish these slides. Uh, additional questions. Scores are not provided to all applicants. If applications are NFFC for NHMRC scores are not provided, it would be good if all applicants received these scores. 
Cindy, would you like to add anything there in, in relation to that particular question? Uh, I might have to pass that one on to um, um, someone, Ragini, because um, sorry, um, because scores aren't. Um, but we'll we'll um, we'll definitely take that question um, out for con under consideration. I, I think there are different um, considerations for reporting of scores to individual um, applicants uh, versus the um, uh, funding rates and statistics that we produce on uh, uh, make available publicly. But that's definitely something I'll take it. Uh, we'll, we'll take into account um, in in the latter. Um, I, I might actually hand over to Anne um, with regards to the individual scores question. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, the provision of feedback um, to applicants is something that I know is of great interest to the sector and we're very keen um, to sort of work with applicant scenarios um, to provide that feedback. It's something that, it's a program of work that we're actively progressing at the moment. Um, across both of our administering hubs, actually. Um, so just looking at the data that's collected um, sort of during that, you know, that pre-award assessment phase and how we can package it up in a way that is useful and constructive and consistent for applicants because we want it to be useful and we want it to contain information that gives a good indication of just the breadth and quality of applications that were received and how an individual application is benchmarked against those that, that group of submissions. Um, so I guess the key message here is that it's um, something that we're actively working on and hopefully you will see it rolled out across not just NHMRC but also the Business Grants Hub um, in the next few months. Thank you, Anne. The next question is milestone reporting in Sapphire. Um, it's a function still active for MRFF grants. However, the process is to submit these directly by email. This is causing confusion and additional burden when these reports are completed twice. Can MRFF either make it possible to report in Sapphire or organize with NHMRC to remove the option? I might um, attempt to answer that. Uh, parts of it we also um, take on notice so that we can discuss it further with NHMRC. But um, we are definitely aware of that. And NHMRC is uh, consistently seeking to improve their Sapphire functionality at this point in time as well. They're working on a, a large range of uh, priority enhancements to Sapphire, and this is definitely being considered as well. Um, but to give you a concrete response to this, I, I have to take this one on notice. Um, any other questions? I think we've answered all the that have come in so far. If not, I might move back to the final part of the presentation. So um, finally, I'd just like to remind everyone, please do keep connected with us. We really value the engagement with the research administration officers and our grantees. We're really receptive to any feedback or any suggestions for improvements that you might have. And we definitely engage with our hubs actively to try to address them um, as soon as uh, they're raised. You can engage with us on a variety of fronts. You can subscribe to the MRFF News. Um, the, research, the link is provided here. You can send any questions either through the hubs if they pertain to specific grants or if they're very general questions, they can be directly emailed to our MRFF email address. You can register for MRFF grant opportunities on grants.gov. In addition, you can also follow um, the Department of Health and Aged Care on Twitter for MRFF updates. I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming today. Um, there is, sorry, one additional question, so I might take that since we've got a couple of uh, minutes and then um, sign off. Are there any improvements to the checking of eligibility of CIs in the pipeline for REOs. Um, this one, uh, again, we'll have to take on board and uh, on notice because eligibility of CIs and um, the uh, platform that uh, does these sorts of checks is, is actually uh, with the hub. So NHMRC um, through uh, their system Sapphire, 
At the moment, the system doesn't uh, conduct checks of uh, CIs directly, but um, this also has been a question that's been raised in the past and is on their radar. Um, at this stage, however, it's not um, front and center, but definitely something for us to consider and pass on to NHMRC and um, BGH for further discussions. Um, an additional question on progress reports. Any update on when the new progress report template will be available? With all MRFF grants needing to report at the same time, it will be a significant burden for some research offices. We will need to contact CIs early so that we don't end up with an avalanche of reports to process at the last minute. It would be great if the new template could be ready in June, thanks. Um, so in relation to that question, at this stage, um, there are no anticipated significant changes to the progress report template um, prior to June. But if that is the case, if there is something that's identified that needs to be immediately implemented, we will certainly make that available up front uh, well before um, the June timeframe. Also, in relation to progress reports and final reports through NHMRC, we have moved to standardizing some of the timelines for these reports, especially the progress reports, which are now due for grants uh, around 30th of September, where there's annual reporting, and for grants with biannual reporting, they're due on, um, towards the end of March, in addition to being due on uh, in end of September. So that hopefully that predictable cycle of reporting especially for grants administered through NHMRC, should help alleviate some of that uh, burden and make the reporting cycles more predictable for the sector. Um, once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please feel free uh, to send them through. And um, as I stated, the questions along with the presentation slides will be made available after the ARIO webinar. Thank you, everyone.